Okay, hi again to everyone to the final talk of uh, the day. I remember to you that uh, uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, uh, Central Europe time, uh, there will be a, a sort of self-presentation, a sort of social event in, uh, in the common room of Gaza. I, invite you all to take part so we can uh, at least virtually have uh, a, a bit of uh, friendship, a bit of uh, um, possibility to speak and to know each other. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel Harlow, for being here with us, even if only virtually. I hope that will be another occasion in which uh, he will be real, completely real, and uh, in Urbino. And uh, you know that uh, Daniel is a very important uh, physicist. Uh, he won an uh, uh, important prize for uh, his discovery on quantum information and black hole. And uh, you know that uh, uh, his famous Jeru Jerusalem lecture are a point of departure for many of us to, to understand something about this uh, very difficult stuff that is the topic of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, school. And so it is wonderful that uh, Daniel is with us uh, as one of the principal speakers of the school. It is, it is uh, exactly the guy that we need to understand better this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, Daniel is uh, in big comfort with philosophers. He took part many times to debate with philosophers, and this is a very good thing. Not all physicists are so available to speak with philosophers. And uh, um, Daniel will, will give uh, lecture in a real sense, in the sense that it is possible to interrupt him every, every when without problems, to ask. Uh, whatever you, you want. Uh, it, it is a, a, a real seminar, even if there are a lot of people. And uh, I thank you, Daniel, again. And I, and I give, uh, give him the microphone. Go ahead, Daniel. All right, uh, grazie Vincenzo. Thank you for the in, uh, invitation. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess I have I have four lectures here. I'm happy to uh, speak to all of you. Um, I wasn't totally sure how to pitch um, the lectures. I guess there's a some combination of philosophers and physicists and among both various levels of background in these topics. Um, so in the end, my my lectures will be fairly introductory. Um, I will try to focus um, on the logical structure of things, why they are the way they are, um, not so much on the mathematical derivations. Um, I think although Daniel, that's, Daniel, yeah. the, the screen now is black. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. I'm going to okay. write it. It's going, this okay. is going okay. to be a Blackboard lecture. Um, so uh, I, I'm going. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm going to focus on the logic. I'm. I'm not so much going to give mathematical derivations. Um, and uh, I think it's that's the correct thing to do for this audience, but I, I should also emphasize that it's that it's really not possible to understand these things without also understanding the mathematical derivations. So you should not infer from my presentation that I think that one can work productively on these things um, without uh, familiarizing oneself with the equations and really understanding how these things work. But nonetheless, I'll do my best to uh, give you the big picture uh, so that you can fill in more later according to your interest. Um, uh, and as Vincenzo said, uh, I'm happy to take questions um, at any point during the lecture. Uh, that's kind of the idea. Um, I won't necessarily try to address specific things in the philosophical literature, mostly just because of my own ignorance, not, not because I necessarily have any particular 
questions, but I, I, I've, I've thought about such things a lot. So I'm, I'm also happy to answer philosophical questions on the fly. I'll probably do a better job answering the questions you guys are, think are interesting if you ask them to me instead of me trying to guess what you think is interesting. Um, okay, so um, the lecture today, I'm gonna start uh, with a very basic question, um, which is why is gravity um, different? Uh, so um, you're presumably familiar with the fact that um, all of the physics that we know except for gravity fits into the standard model of particle physics, um, where we can kind of heuristically describe the standard model of particle physics like this. So we have some, we have some gauge fields, F, we have some, uh, some fermions, psi m. Um, we have the Higgs field. Uh, and then we have some interactions of various kinds between them. So in particular, there are so-called Yukawa interactions. Um, that look like this, phi A, psi M, psi N, plus its Hermitian conjugate. Um, there's a mass for the Higgs boson, very important. Uh, and then there's some self-interaction of the Higgs boson, phi A dagger, phi A quantity squared. Okay. Uh, and that's really it. You know, this is a pretty short equation, um, you know, I runs over gauge bosons. Um, M runs over uh, quarks and leptons. Um, and, uh, and A runs over the Higgs field. Um, and, you know, almost all of known physics um, can be explained quantitatively starting from this uh, formula um, for the Lagrangian of the standard model of particle physics. Um, so there are a few exceptions. The big one is gravity, which we're gonna talk about in this lecture a lot. Um, but just for completeness, I'll mention that there are also a few other things which we don't know how, or which we probably are not explained using this Lagrangian, um, such as the masses of neutrinos, uh, the dark matter, uh, the origin of, non-zero baryon number in the universe. Um, these are all observed phenomena, which cannot be explained um, using this equation. Okay. Now, um, we can, so this is a, a classical Lagrangian that I wrote down, um, but we can quantize it. Uh, so there are various ways of, of doing that. Um, at the heuristic level, um, perhaps the most convenient to talk about um, is the path integral where we try to compute overlaps between initial and final states evolved by some Hamiltonian. Um, and we do that by using some integral over these uh, various fields. So there's some, the gauge potentials, this F is the derivative of this A. Um, we have the fermions, um, we have the Higgs, um, we have, boundary conditions, which match these in and out states. Uh, and then we just integrate the action d4 x l um, up in the exponential. Okay. So there are various subtleties of the with this, but morally speaking, this is what we do. Um, and this prescription for computing, you know, amplitudes from initial to final states, um, is good up to extremely high energies. So it's in fact not good up to arbitrarily high energies. So this is good um, um, up to energies which are of order um, e to the order of 100 times the mass of the electron, um, which is a pretty high energy scale if, if I say so myself, um, you know, much higher than the Planck scale. So these, um, Eventually this theory breaks down at this scale due to something called the Landau pole. Uh, 
we're not sure what happens after that. Um, but since anyways, we think quantum gravity will be important long before that, usually we don't worry too much about this. And so for, for these lectures, we'll just sort of ignore this and say that this is well-defined. So um, this theory has been extraordinarily successful. Um, you know, it's fit all the data for going on 50 years now. Um, you know, including various amazing tests like, uh, you know, the agreement of the magnetic moment of the electron between theory and experiment to 10 significant figures and so on. Um, now, if you're familiar, so any questions about the standard model now before we go on to gravity? Everyone's good with the standard model? Now, okay. Um, if you're shy, you can also type questions in the chat. I can see them. So, you know, after a year of teaching online, uh, lots of experience. Yes, there's a question, Marco, please. Except I could. Uh, uh, yes, just a curiosity. Uh, when, when, where does it come from, this bound uh, of uh, E to the order of uh, 100? I mean, uh, uh, how yeah. can you realize that this prescription breaks down at that uh, energy scale? Yeah, so so these these coupling constants are not really constants in some sense. They're they're dependent on energy. Um, you can you know if you so you have to specify an energy scale before you write down this action. And um, a couple of the couplings here um, grow logarithmically with energy. So in particular, this uh, Higgs self-coupling lambda and um, the self-coupling of the U1 part of the, of the interactions, which is kind of, it's not quite electromagnetism, it's the hypercharge, but anyway, it's the same idea. So those grow um, logarithmically. So at, and since it's logarithmically, you have to kind of go exponentially high in order for them to become order one. Um, so that's sometimes called a Landau pole. The the, pole, the the name pole is misleading. So if you if you take the perturbative formula and you extrapolate it, there's a pole. But it, when a cu once the coupling is order one, you probably shouldn't believe the perturbative formula anymore. So the right thing to say is just that the coupling becomes strong at this scale, uh, and then we don't know what happens. At right. I mean, then uh, this theory just is becomes sort of not very well defined. There are all sorts of things we could add to it, which would have no effect at low energies, but would become extremely important at that scale. Uh, and we don't know whether there's some continuum quantum field theory that you know persists arbitrarily high energy scales, which which reduces to this in the infrared with nothing else. Um, I see. So, so this is a, a bound on uh, the validity of the standard model Lagrange, and not not about the prescription of calculating scattering amplitudes by means of quantum integrals. So, I mean that one well, is. Uh, well, it's you know, but I mean, it, right. it kind of, yeah, I mean, but it kind of is because if you tried to use this formula to compute a very high energy scattering amplitude, you you wouldn't really know what to do. So, okay, you know, it, 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 even if you had a very good computer, right? I mean, so that that's I mean, you know, it's too hard to do it with pencil and paper. But even if I give you a really good computer, you wouldn't want you wouldn't know what to do at these energy scales. So, so I would say it's really a problem with the theory. Okay. Okay. Actually, thank you. But I mean, usually most physicists don't care because this is such a high energy scale. We think quantum gravity is important long before, so, you know. Okay, so, um, so if you're familiar at all with classical gravity, then um, there's a natural guess for how we should add gravity to this, right? So clearly we have to add gravity to this. You know, we, we feel gravity every day. We see it in the stars. You know, we need to, we need to add it to this theory. Um, so the natural guess for what we should do, um, at least if you know classical gravity or have encountered it at all, um, is that we should upgrade this formula to just include an integral over the metric, g mu nu, um, in addition to these integrals over the various standard model fields. Um, and then now in the exponent, um, we should put um, an integral d4x squared of minus g times this action that we wrote before, uh, where now the various derivatives here get promoted to covariant derivatives in the usual way. Uh, and then we should also add this um, 
this Einstein-Hilbert action, 16 pi g uh, integral d4 x squared of minus g times the Ricci scalar. Okay. So, so you know, based on the you know the 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 hundred years of experience that went into writing this down, this is the the obvious thing that you should try to write down. Um, Unfortunately, um, this doesn't seem to work uh, so nicely, um, despite the fact that it worked very well in this case, you know. Um, and indeed, despite the fact that we've now known about both quantum mechanics and gravity for more than a century, um, no one has ever written down a theory of quantum gravity that is both consistent with all the observations we've done so far and also consistent with itself. You know, despite the fact that, you know, modulo these kind of issues that most people would say are not that serious in principle, you know, despite the fact that we could just combine easily electromagnetism and the strong force and the weak force with quantum mechanics, um, we have not managed to do the same for gravity, you know, certainly not by just doing the same kind of thing where we write down a path integral with an action that's a local functional of some fields and then uh, integrate over the fields. Um, so um, in textbooks, in, well, in some textbooks and in many popular articles, there are, there are two reasons that are often given um, for why this local path integral prescription breaks down um, in the case of gravity. So, uh, so problems. So problem number one. Um, so problem number one is, uh, is non-renormalizability. long word to write out. So um, if you take this metric tensor, g mu nu, and you expand it, so say you write it as the flat space metric, h mu nu, um, plus uh, I'll throw in some factor of square root of 16 pi g, for a reason that you'll see in a minute, um, times some metric perturbation, h mu nu, then, you know, roughly speaking, this, um, this Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian just becomes some kinetic term for this H. Uh, so that's why I put this here is to, to cancel the one over 16 pi G there to get a conventionally normalized kinetic term for the graviton. Uh, and then there are various interactions. So there's something like 16 pi G times H times uh, DH squared. You know, and then there's something like uh, 16 pi g times h squared times dh squared um, and so on where uh, i've been very lazy here about how the indices are contracted and what happens with where the exactly the derivatives are acting and so on but hopefully you can use your imagination to think about various ways that the indices might be contracted um, so this is some, you know, quantum field theory action, right? We have some kinetic term, we have some interactions, we can try and do some perturbation theory, you know, bring down these interactions and do the thing that, uh, you know, people at the LHC do every day. Okay. It's more annoying because of all the indices, which I'm hiding, but it's conceptually the same thing. Now, uh, if you ask, so if you think about what is this coupling constant, right? So we can we can try to interpret. So this this 16 pi g here is somehow the coupling constant or square root of 16 pi g, right? And we can we can turn that into a length, right? So we can uh, I can introduce a length scale like this, which I guess conventionally people write it like this, 8 pi g. So I've been ignoring c and h bar, but just in this formula, I'll I'll write them for you, um, c cubed. Uh, so there's some length scale, which is like, uh, you know, eight times um, 10 to the minus 35 meters, okay, which is called the Planck scale. And so you see up to these H bars and Cs and so on, that's the same as this coupling constant here. So, so this is a rather, at least it looks like a rather weak coupling constant. On the other hand, it's a coupling constant with units of length. So it's not really dimensionless. And so we have to think a little bit about 
what does it really mean that this number is small? I mean, it's small compared to people, okay, because that's what meters are. Um, so actually, the, the modern way of thinking about this, which you know if you've learned any quantum field theory, is that you should really invert this, and you should talk about how these things are suppressed by, by, by an inverse power of a mass. And so we can define the mass, M Planck, um, to be one over L Planck, um, where uh, this is something like, uh, you know, four times 10 to minus nine um, kilograms. Um, or we can also call that something like uh, two times 10 to the 18 um, GeV over C squared, if you if you like those kinds of units. Um, so, so this is a theory where the interactions are suppressed by ever increasing powers of this mass M Planck, right? Because this mass M Planck has, uh, has, the, has the eight pi G in the denominator. So then this is suppressed by like one over M Planck, one over M Planck squared and so on and so forth. Uh, and so what this really leads to is a perturbation theory um, in energy over M Planck, okay? That's what it means when you have a dimension full coupling constant is that the real coupling constant is the energy and units of whatever your dimension full coupling constant is, which here is M Planck. Uh, and so you can see this, this 10 to the 18 GV is a, is a very large energy for a scattering process. You know, it's not a large energy compared to, you know, my mass or something, right? But, but I, I'm not a fundamental particle. I've got 10 to the 23 particles in me and, you know, it, uh, 10 to the minus 19, 10 to the minus nine kilogram is a lot of energy for one particle to carry. Um, so um, what this really means is that this theory just becomes um, strongly coupled um, at energies which are of order M Planck. Okay, and so the, the technical term for that is non-renormalizability. Um, so at that point, um, this theory, we don't really know how to treat it perturbatively. And in particular, if we were to add other interactions to this action, which are also suppressed by this scale, then they would become equally important at this scale. And then probably it was a mistake to just write the Einstein term here. And then without further input, we just kind of don't really know what to write down. We need some new input about what goes on beyond that point. Okay. Um, so, so that's the non-renormalizability of quantum gravity. Okay, so that's problem number one. Any questions about that? Uh, Enrico has a question, please. Yeah, might be terribly naive, but ju just just to make sure that I'm following everything. So. In which sense is the is the way in which gravity becomes strongly coupled at the Planck mass, at the Planck scale, different from the sense in which the, 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 the standard model that we saw before becomes strongly coupled when we find the Landau pole and so the, the prescription breaks down. So right. are these different or is it just that it's a, a lower energy scale, the one for which gravity breaks down? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's why I mentioned it. Is so I, I think it's actually the same. Okay. Um, I don't think that conceptually there's not, at least not obviously a difference between the two, except for the one that you said, which is that this is a ridiculously high energy scale, whereas this is only a, well, I mean, yeah, or maybe like I would even say this is a ridiculously high energy scale, but this is like a, just a sort of absurdly ridiculous high energy scale. Yes. So, so somehow, you know, this is the one that comes in first. So we have to, we have to take it seriously. Yes. Um, okay. And in fact, that's part of what I'm going to say in a minute about why I don't think this is really the problem with quantum gravity. I, I'm, I'm first telling you what the conventional wisdom is before I complain about it. It's good to do that, right? Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so now, so before I complain, let's 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 write down the other problem, which is usually discussed, um, which is diffeomorphism invariance. Okay. So. Um, so the standard model Lagrangian uh, is invariant under a rather restricted set of changes of space-time coordinates, 
basically only the Poincaré ray group consisting of time and space translation, spatial rotations and boosts, Lorentz boosts, and uh, everything generated by that. And then strictly speaking, it's also invariant under CPT. Um, gravity, on the other hand, is invariant on a, under a much larger set of space-time coordinate transformations. In fact, the Einstein-Hilbert action is invariant under all space-time coordinate transformations. Um, if we couple it to the standard model, that's not quite true because the standard model breaks time reversal and so on, but will at least uh, diffeomorphisms that are continuously connected to the identity transformation are invariances of the standard model coupled to general relativity. Um, so this is a much larger space-time symmetry group than we had in ordinary quantum field theory, like the standard model. Um, and in fact, in order for the physics of the graviton to make sense, um, this symmetry under diffeomorphism transformations has to be a gauge symmetry. So it has to be something that's viewed as a redundancy of description that we should quotient by to recover physical observables, um, which is not the way that boosts and translations are, are viewed in the standard model. There it's viewed as a global symmetry, but in gravity, it has to be promoted or demoted is maybe a better word to gauge symmetry. Um, and that's similar to the story with, with Maxwell theory, right? In Maxwell's electrodynamics, there's a gauge symmetry, a mu goes to a mu plus d mu lambda. And uh, in order for the physics of the photon to be consistent, uh, you have to view this as a redundancy of description and not as something that sends physical states to other distinct physical states. You have to say that two states that differ by a gauge transformation are identical. Um, but if you think about it, um, well, well, so certainly experimentally, the, indeed, the graviton seems to be massless. For example, in, uh, in this uh, recent event where LIGO and Fermi detected um, a neutron star merger, both in gravity waves and in photons, uh, the two signals arrived you know, basically at the same time, despite having propagated for billions of light years. Um, you know, which is a pretty good indication that the gravity and light are moving at the same speed. Although of course there's always some, some error bar there. So, so there could, you know, it doesn't really tell you the graviton mass is zero, but at least tells you it's very small. Um, which then indeed requires that, like I said, the diff invariance is gauge symmetry. Um, now, once you decide that you're gonna live in a world where diffeomorphism is invariance is the gauge symmetry, then that leads to a variety of confusions. Because, for example, time translation is a diffeomorphism. So, what does it mean to say that time translation is merely a redundancy of description? It doesn't feel like it, right? I don't. I don't feel like day by day I'm I'm living through a redundancy of description, and you know I'm I'm really the same now as I was when I was born, right? That's kind of confusing. Um, and indeed, you know, the mathematical expression of that is that because of diff invariance, um, so diff invariance. Um, implies that local operators, um, you know, such as, um, you know, phi of x, you know, some scalar at some point, or, you know, the electric field at some other point, right, you know, um, these are not physical. Because, uh, well, which point, right? It's the, the theory is covariant. It, it, is, it is the invariant under coordinate transformation. So if I just tell you, you know, the point that where X equals two and Y equals seven and Z equals minus six, I mean, who care? I mean, what does that even mean, right? We can just change coordinates, right? So, so that's not a physically measurable thing. Um, so, um, so we have to somehow learn to, so, so, so the upshot is that with diff invariance, we have to learn to live Um, with non-local observables. Um, which in practice means observables that are defined relationally. So, you know, if you've, if you've read Einstein's work, right? I mean, he's always talking about, you know, rods and clocks that you use to kind of decide where you are. And then you don't assign any physical meaning to any particular coordinates, but if you build some collection of rods and clocks, then you can say, oh, I walk, you know, five rods this way and then seven rods that way in this thing that I built, you know, and I'm wearing this watch and I look and see at the time it's saying, and then I ask what's the electric field there, that should be physical. 
Uh, and so somehow because of different variants, we just have to learn to talk like that. Okay, Eric has a question. Uh, so um, uh, th this problem seems to me to arise from a very flat-footed way of looking at how uh, kind of math works in physical theories. Just because we have two things are instantiated by the same mathematical operation doesn't mean that they mean the same thing. In classical physics, if I add the momentum of two particles, you know, the vectors representing the linear momentum of two particles, that could either be representing a collision, a physical interaction, or it could be represent, or I could be calculating the center of mass, a factitious quantity, even though it's the same mathematical operation. So just, just, just because time translation is a can be thought of as a diffeomorphism doesn't mean automatically that I must think of it, that I must interpret it the way I interpret other times when I use diffeomorphism. So it, it is, it may be the problem here that people are just assuming that whenever I use a mathematical operation, it must always mean the same thing, which I think is a very, which isn't really how I think how math works in physics. Well, I wouldn't necessarily, yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm again gonna say also that I don't think this is really the problem. So I, I'm, as, as I said, I'm first telling you what people usually say are the problems before telling you what I think is the problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, so uh, although I wouldn't use the word problem to describe this myself, actually, it is a real difference from say Maxwell theory, because in Maxwell theory, the description of the theory, I mean, you, you, you always, to even know what you're talking about, you know, you have to first pick some mathematical theater, theater where you're gonna discuss, right? And so, you know, say, I mean, in quantum field theory, for example, we can say we're gonna have states in a Hilbert space that are labeled by configurations of fields at a fixed time. That's uh, a thing we often say in quantum field theory. And yeah, we can always change that and go to some other basis, but I mean, we have to first agree on something or we just want, we're not gonna be able to communicate, right? Um, but if we try to do what I just said, for gravity, it doesn't work because um, you know there are different field create, create configurations. You know, in the sense of like functions from the set of space coordinates to some target space that we think are actually physically equivalent. Um, and actually, even that is true in electromagnetism because of gauge symmetry. So I picked a bad example, but it's it's uh, it's less severe because. Um, it's there, it's sort of local, right? So yeah, you can shift the fields around locally, but you can't move them around in space. But in gravity, you can also move them around in space. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there are many different ways to think about it, but so I don't, I don't wanna pick one and say that's definitely the right way of thinking about it. But however you, however you think about it, there is a difference here in whatever language you use that you just have to be careful. You have to be clear in the end about, you know, what is the, mathematical construction of the set of physically meaningful configurations in the system, right? Configurations where there's some experiment that you could do, which would be different in the two configurations. The claim is that two, two states that differ by a gauge transformation, every single experiment you could possibly do would, reserve, would return the same result in those configurations. And so um, in some sense, it's and, and in fact, it, I mean, it's even worse than that. If you, if you try to have them be different, if you try to allow them be, to be different, then the dynamics of the theory would not be well-defined. You know, you, if I gave you the configuration at t equals zero, you wouldn't know how to evolve it to the future because you could always throw in a gauge transformation, right? So, 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 so you don't have a unique evolution from state to state to state until you quotient by this redundancy of the gauge symmetry. Um, and, that, and that's true for, for, for diffeomorphisms. Um, in, in gravity, not, not in quantum field theory. Yeah, th thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so this is kind of the, the mainstream view, I would say, though. It's, so is that, you know, so certainly these are two things that are not, or at least, well, I mean, modulo this issue with the Landau pole at very high energies. The conventional view is these are not problems in the standard model. Um, they're new things that come in gravity. Uh, so, um, you know, on the other hand, and so here's where I start being contrarian, um, neither of these necessarily tells you that trying to formulate quantum gravity along these lines as a local path integral can't possibly make sense, okay? So there's two pieces of data. There's the piece of data that so far nobody has succeeded in formulating gravity along these lines as a local path integral. 
And there's the piece of data that gravity has these issues, but it's not clear that any theory with these issues can't be formulated as a local path integral. And in fact, that's false, okay? So there are plenty of theories which have one or both of these issues, but nonetheless can be formulated as a local path integral. So just to give a few examples, so, so non-renormalizability is old hat. I mean, even in the standard model, you know, in the history of particle physics, there were non-renormalizable theories of parts of the standard model, like Fermi's theory of the weak interactions or the, the pion Lagrangian, the chiral Lagrangian that describes the low energy interactions of pions. So those were just as renormalizable, non-renormalizable as gravity. You know, they had the same kind of what's called power divergences. So not this logarithmic thing that's in the standard model, but really something where you have an expansion in energy over, moment, over um, energy over some scale. Uh, and what happened in the standard model was that indeed the interactions become strong at that scale, but then there's just some new physics that comes in, which is the standard model. And uh, at scales above that, you're just back to, again, to sort of weakly interacting quantum field theory with the local Lagrangian. Okay. So just because something is non-renormalizable, so what, right? I mean, that just means that there's strong coupling and then there has to be something new. But that's all it tells you. It doesn't tell you that you have to take everything you know and throw it out the window. Okay. So, so this by itself is not sufficient to say that we have to throw everything out and start over. Okay. Um, and in fact, I should, should say that, um, so there is, a, there is an attempted program for doing quantum gravity, which is called asymptotic safety. Um, and you know, I, in my view, loop quantum gravity is a subset of that. I think some loop quantum gravity people agree with that, some maybe don't. Um, and that program is exactly what I just said. You just say, this is non-renormalizable. Okay, so it gets strong, strongly coupled at the Planck scale, but then we just look for some you know, new degrees of freedom you know, such that we can still do a path integral with a local action. And uh, those new degrees of freedom will somehow be the ones that it somehow explain the strong coupling uh, you know, without any radical change of, of the basic uh, foundations. Okay, that's, so that's the idea of asymptotic safety. They haven't succeeded, but you know, a priori, there's no reason why that might not be how it works. I mean, there's historical precedent for things working that way, uh, at least when there's not gravity. Okay. Um, similarly, um, yeah. So different variance is kind of confusing. You know, okay, you can't really talk about local operators and so on. But you know, and some people, like for example, I guess Jacobson was mentioned in the last talk as someone who thinks that different variance is the the essential thing that underlies everything in, in quantum gravity and so on, um, you, you know. But uh, if you go to sufficiently low numbers of space-time dimensions, there are diffeomorphism invariant actions that are renormalizable. They're not non-renormalizable, okay? And indeed, you can just make sense out of them. You can just quantize them. Uh, uh, for example, one that is popular these days is called Jakiv Teitelboim gravity. It's some action of metric talking to a scalar in one plus one dimensions, and you can just quantize it. There's a path in a local path integral, everything is fine. No, no big uh, mystery. Okay. So again, that somehow, you know, shows these examples show that, you know, although these are certainly features of gravity that we need to understand, they're probably not the reason that, you know, here we are a hundred years after, after the discovery of general relativity and quantum mechanics, and we still don't have a good theory of quantum gravity. It's not because of these things. Okay. So uh, let me ask now again, are any questions here? I think Manus has a question. Yeah, um, but isn't this a peculiarity of two dimensions that uh, these different varying theories are renormalizable? Yeah, yeah, but right. But I mean, if you, if, but if you believed in asymptotic safety, then there would be some strongly coupled theory of gravity in three plus one dimensions that would be different variant and renormalizable. You know, right. and they would just say, we haven't found it yet because it's strongly coupled. So and then, I don't think we can categorically rule that out. I mean, I don't believe in it, but I, I can't categorically rule it out. And then also on the different variants, um, I mean, a lot of properties in black hole thermodynamics are, can be derived from different variants, right? Uh, this is kind of, central to Walt's whole approach. And I think that's also what, what Jacobson is. I, I don't think I would use the word derived. I think you can use the word motivated. 
but it's a central element in some of the some of the derivation. I'm not. I'm not going to disagree that diffeomorphism invariance is a, is a, is an is an essential ingredient in gravity. I, I agree with that. Um, but I wouldn't say that things like the Bekenstein-Hawking formula are purely consequences of diffeomorphism invariance. There are ways of thinking about them where diffeomorphism invariance plays a role, but there's always some other assumption, which is, uh, I would say, the one that's really doing the heavy lifting. Um, you know, because there are these examples like JT and one plus one, where, you know, if you if you just try to make sense of it as a normalizable theory, then there is no black hole entropy formula. I mean, entropy is infinity. So um, there, there's a, another question from Siddharth. Uh, yeah, just a very elementary question. So you use the phrase local path integral. Do you simply mean that the, the Grangian has local interactions only? Or yeah, yeah. What I mean is that it the action has this form I wrote where you have a single integral over space time and then some function that's locally constructed out, of, you know, it's just constructed out of the fields and their derivatives at this point x. So there's no terms that multiply fields at different points. And that is bad because we just, is, that's just a sort of ground floor assumption that we don't want non-local interactions in our- theory. Well, that are, I, I mean, the conventional view is it's good because it prevents a causality, okay? So, so, I mean, if we could understand quantum gravity with the local action, we would be happy because that would, well, I mean, it depends what our goals are, but if we're lazy, we'll be happy because that means we can fit gravity into the sort of same kind of ideas that we've used to understand all the other forces. I'm going to right. argue that we can't, uh, and maybe that's good too, because it makes, you know, variety is the spice of life. Um, so you're sorry. going to argue that you can't fit gravity into it. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to argue gravity. that this is not going to work, uh, but I'm not, it's not going to be a rigorous argument necessarily. Uh, well, you'll see what the argument is. That's... Okay, and, and presumably there's some part of it where you'll, I mean, is there some argument further that that gives us sort of bad, uh, predictions or does not fit with something we know or well, I'm gonna try yeah just wait you'll see you'll see what I say. Yeah. Uh, it looks like Daniele has a question. Yes, thanks. Uh, so it's a probably simplistic question and we'll just prove how confused I am at all this. But uh, so you said you said before that uh, in you 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 yeah there are historical precedents of uh, and a scientific hypothesis, a physical hypothesis at this level of abstraction being categorically ruled out. Can you can you make one of those examples? How how can you think of such um, abstract hypothesis being categorically ruled out? Um, well, I'm not. I mean, uh, you know, there's always. I mean, there's always some loophole if you don't assume anything, right? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that I was saying that anything is categoric. I mean, I think I was saying that I couldn't rule it out, right? Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I mean, yeah, the only principle I know that categorically rules things out is that they have to agree with all the experiments that we've done so far. I don't think there's any other principle that we can apply without any further caveats. I mean, I suppose you guys are philosophers, so even that one, maybe you think, oh, it's all, you know, it's all, it's all a delusion or something. But I mean, presumably that's not the kind of stuff we're trying to get into in this school. No, that, that wasn't what, that, I wasn't going to suggest that it's, a, it's an illusion. I was certainly yeah. going to suggest that there are, uh, there are doubts on how to settle this kind of very abstract levels of uh, physics empirically. Yeah. How, how are we going to go out and check no, no, but you, you never, I mean, you never really know anything, right? I mean, we're all, we're all secretly Bayesians, right? So the best we can do is sort of, you know, have our provisional theory of what we think is the most likely theory of the world. And then we can, you know, keep testing that theory and our confidence in it can increase or decrease, but it, it'll, it'll never be a hundred percent. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let me just mention two other sort of less, um, let me, two other, so, so these are sort of two reasons why one might 
think that gravity should be different, but as we've been discussing, they're not great reasons. Um, so let me mention um, one more that has some value, but I think is also not decisive, um, which is that, so, so this is a, so, so this is a, maybe just more of a side comment, just, so in the theories of, of quantum gravity, um, so the only theories of quantum gravity that we've found, found so far, which really seem to be mathematically consistent, uh, and I'll add that, remember, I had two requirements of a theory of quantum gravity. It has to be both mathematically consistent and consistent with all the experiments we've done so far. And so the ones I'm about to mention fail the second test, but at least they're mathematically consistent, um, are ones that come out of string theory, um, at least in three plus one dimensions. In, lo in low numbers of dimensions, there are, there are theories of quantum gravity, like I mentioned, where you just have a local path integral and so on. But if you want, if you want to be in three plus one dimensions, the only examples I know um, of something that really is fairly clearly well-defined are in string theory. Uh, and we don't really understand string theory in general, but we understand it enough, certainly in some limits, to see that um, it doesn't look like this. Okay, it's not, it's not formulated as you just have some metric and some matter fields and, and three plus one dimensions and, and you do an integral over them. That's, that's clearly not what, what string theory is going to be. Um, so uh, somebody said, yeah, but frequentists are just Bayesians who are in denial. We, if you wanna take me up on that, we can discuss it at the coffee break. Um, okay. Um, so uh, in particular, like if you think about, um, so, our best, so our best theory so far, which we'll talk about more in these lectures, um, uh, is this it come from come from these ADS CFT correspondence that uh, Sebastian mentioned, which, as I said, it it fails the test of being consistent with experiment, but it passes the test of being mathematically consistent. Uh, and at least in these theories, um, it's definitely not a local path in a role. You know, not um, a local um, path integral um, over you know metrics. Oh, well, over a metric plus matter. Um, and in fact, the, the fundamental or microscopic description of what's going on lives in a, in a lower number of dimensions. So it's really quite different from the way that we quantize the other forces, right? I mean, it's really very different. Uh, and so the, the goal of this lecture is to, for me to say a bit about why I, what I, really, I think is really the difference in gravity um, which uh, requires it to be quantized in such a crazy way, you know, in a way that's so different from all of the other forces. Okay, so that, that's kind of the end of the introduction. I, I forget, how long are, am I actually supposed to go? Just so I, I'm, I think I'm okay, but I'm just, can maybe one of the organizers tell me when we're supposed to end? So you have two hours, a two hour that's slot. Good. So it's like a hour and 10 minutes still. You have? Yeah, okay, so I think I think we're we're in good shape. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I, I mean, presuming I I can sort of, I just kind of mix the Q and A session throughout the talk. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, I was telling you the the entire slot without the. Yes, yeah, we've been doing very good. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So before I now try to tell you what's the special thing, any any further questions about things I've said so far, except for Bayesians versus frequentists, which we can discuss in the break. Dan, I, I have a very general question about ADS CFT, but if you're going to talk about it in more detail, um, I'll, I'll hold off. I'm certainly going to talk about it in more detail. Um, probably not this time, not next time, but in the third lecture. Um, okay, then I, I think I think I'll just hold off and, and, and see if you address it. Okay. May okay. I just ask another clarification? Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, so sorry, I, I, I guess I missed why it's a problem that ADS CFD does not look like a local path integral. Is that why is that a problem for quantizing gravity? You're such a normative fellow. I, I don't want to say that things are good and bad. Um, it's different. It's different. That's all I'm saying. It's uh, you know, is we have all these other forces which we just 
you know, we took classical physics as we understood it, you know, in the 19th century. I mean, this is basically not up to notation. This is 19th century physics here. Okay. And the only thing that we did was we decided to integrate over the fields and we put this thing up in the exponent. So, so it's a pretty small modification in the end, at least if you think about it this way. I mean, of course, on some level, quantum mechanics is a huge mod modification of classical physics, right? Uh, so I don't want to downplay that. But just sort of at the level of equations and so on, when you write it this way, it doesn't look like a very big modification. Um, whereas uh, when you when you do ADS CFT, you know there's no fundamental role for this action, the analog of this action at all. It's you know it's something that emerges with a with a certain regime of validity, but it's not a good description of what's going on. And for many of the questions that you could ask of the theory and the the description, which does, you know, which is valid for every question that you, you you could ask, looks very different from this or from this. In particular, there's no there's no integral over a metric in in the in the, in the fundamental description. Um, so it's different. That's all I'm saying. It's different, and I want to know why is it so different. With you know, without deciding whether it's good or bad. I would just use the word problem because you had used it for one and two. That's all. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No. I just you know, problem just means a, let's we can say a problem is a reason why uh, you might not be able to quantize it like this. That's the definition of problem as, as used there. Okay. Um, Okay, so so in the given the problem that as we just define the word problem, what is the what is the problem? Okay, I told you some things that are not the problem. Okay, so so here's the claim. So the claim um, is that black holes um, are why uh, gravity is different. So um, before I try to tell you why um, black holes or why gravity is different, let me just first comment a bit about why gravity has black holes and uh, electromagnetism does not have black holes. Okay. So um, there are two features that are essentially unique to gravity among the forces, at least the forces that we know about so far. Um, the first is that gravity is universal. Okay, so uh, if you if you look at this action that we wrote down, there's the square root of minus g here in front of the L, and uh, inside of the L there are covariant derivatives that I didn't write, and all of those cause an interaction between the matter fields and the graviton that cannot be removed um, without destroying this diffeomorphism symmetry. So um, stated more sort of conventionally, right, you can say that, you know, test particles follow geodesics by the equivalence principle, and that can only be true if it's true for all the particles that, you know, you can only have, can't just have some particles that do it and not others. Um, so, on, so, so in, in particular, there is, um, there is nothing neutral. Nothing is neutral. Okay. So that's a special feature of, of gravity number one. Um, and uh, special feature number two um, is that um, gravity is attractive. Okay. And I have to put a star here because there are situations where it's not attractive. Um, for example, in the, co the cosmological constant is gravity, but it's pushing all the galaxies apart from each other. Okay. But so that's what the star means, but it's attractive in, in situations where all the energy and momentum just have to do with particles floating around. You don't have some vacuum energy or something like that. You just have sort of conventional matter particles zipping around. Then gravity is always attractive. And so somehow these two things um, are what give you the existence of black holes. Right. So basic idea of a black hole, right? You have some object, mass m. Um, and uh, we can say of, uh, of radius R. And uh, well, you hopefully know from whenever you learned about Newtonian mechanics, 
that if I'm sitting here at the surface of this object and I want to escape from it, um, there's an escape velocity uh, which I need to exceed uh, in order to escape. At least if you know, if I have a rocket, I don't have to get to the escape velocity all at once. But if I'm if I'm launching myself with a slingshot, at least, um, then then I, there's some velocity that I need to escape. I need I need to exceed to escape, and the velocity is this um, escape velocity square root of of two gm. Um, over the over the radius of the object. Okay. All right, so that's pretty easy to derive. If you never derived it before, you just have to equate the kinetic energy to the gravitational potential energy uh, because you have to climb all the way out of the gravitational potential. So um, this, you see it, it increases as R decreases at fixed mass, right? So if we, if we make this object more and more dense, um, preserving its mass. So we make R smaller, then you see this gets bigger. Um, and eventually, um, if R is less than 2gm over c squared, then this implies that the escape velocity has to be bigger than c, the speed of light. Uh, and so in particular, that means that you can have an object which you can't escape from without moving faster than the speed of light. Uh, and this clearly uses both of these properties, right? Because if you had something that was neutral under gravity, it could always escape, right? We need to, you just have to give it a little kick and it would just kind of float off, right? Uh, and similarly, if, you know, the gravity was sometimes attractive or repulsive, right? I mean, if it was repulsive, you know, then the object would just push the thing away, right? I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need rockets or anything. Um, so um, this uh, and so this radius is is called the the Schwarzschild radius, um, which I, not being German, sometimes have difficulty remembering how to spell. But I think I think I got it right. So um, we'll we'll meet this radius again next time when we when we discuss the mathematics of black holes a little bit more. I should of course comment that so this argument with the escape velocity and so on I actually didn't use general relativity I just used Newtonian gravity um, so it's actually it's a coincidence that the argument I just gave you correctly produces this factor of two this is not really the right way of deriving the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole um, but the idea is the right one you know that you just have an object that's sufficiently dense that the escape velocity would have to exceed the speed of light now um, any questions about that? Hopefully that's high school physics. Okay, so this is just classical black hole. Okay, so it's fine, classical black holes. There's, they're not necessarily that mysterious, right? What we're really interested here in this lecture is quantum gravity. Um, so, uh, so there are various ways to argue that um, a consistent quantum mechanical picture of black hole physics will be hard to find. Uh, so I, I'm now going to just tell you one that I like. Uh, I don't claim that this is uniformly superior to all the other ways of, of seeing it, but I think it kind of gets at the, at the key idea in a nice way. Um, Wait, so, no, sorry. Yeah, please go. Ahead. I think there's someone in the chat who has a question. Oh, isn't please, it too you... much of a coincidence? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, the thing is, uh, neither derivation is going to produce a randomly chosen real number, right? I mean, they all are simple calculations that are going to give you two or four or pi or, I mean, you know, some, something like, like that. So also, you know, I, I never actually checked, but I kind of suspect that if you do it in higher dimensions, it won't work. I suspect it's uh, it's it's special to three plus one dimensions that the coincidence works out like that. Um, but I, I never checked when it, yeah maybe when I maybe when I you know get tenure or retire or whatever then I can I can check. Not I mean it would take like thirty seconds but okay. What can I say I'm a busy guy. Um, so. Uh, How should I say? Okay, so let's so 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 now let's try to introduce um, the contradiction. So 
sorry, or, or, or I don't know, contradiction, a paradox. Okay. Philosophers like paradoxes, right? Um, so uh, let's suppose um, that quantum gravity indeed has a description along the lines of a local path integral with, uh, with an integral over metrics. Um, so uh, if it does, then, uh, well, we could try to do an experiment and test that, right? And so, so what I'm gonna try to argue is that if you try to do an experiment to verify that that's the case, you, you will run into problems that will prevent you from actually doing the experiment. So there are two constraints that any experiment testing quantum gravity has to satisfy. So um, the first is that um, the apparatus um, uh, needs to be um, heavy enough to suppress uh, quantum fluctuations. Okay, so that's uh, the first requirement. If our if our apparatus is very light, it'll be light. It'll be fluctuating all over the place, and it's hard to test locality if you don't even know where you are. On the other hand, um, the apparatus. Um, needs to be light enough um, that um, it doesn't collapse um, to a black hole. That would also be rather inconvenient um, if you were trying to, you know, test the locality of the gravitational path integral, but you you built your whole LHC or whatever, but then it just collapsed into a black hole. And well, if you were there, if you were working on it at the time, that would be very unpleasant. Um, but even if you weren't working on it at the time, you were just, you know, you're a theorist who was somewhere else waiting for the results. Um, well, you would never get the results uh, because the experiment collapsed into a black hole. Okay. Um, but what we're going to see is that if we try to probe locality at the Planck scale, it's it's going to be impossible to to satisfy both of these constraints, um, you know, provided that we we make sure that we're really doing a you know, describe, describing an operational experiment that we can actually do. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, as I said, this is not a, a rigorous argument. This is a heuristic argument, but hopefully enough to to give you the idea. And so now let me make the argument. And so I'm going to follow Einstein and we're going to do the experiment by setting up a bunch of rods that we're going to use to localize where things are when we do the experiment. So, um, so indeed, let's, let's make a, a collection of rods, you know, that are made out of some material. Um, You know, and uh, and it'll, it'll be a three-dimensional collection of rods, but I won't I won't try to draw a three-dimensional lattice in, in real time. It would just make the well, it would just make everyone's life unpleasant, including mine. And then um, the linear size of my collection of rods, the whole collection, let's call it L. Okay. And then we also have to worry about the spacing between the rods, and let's call that a little L. Um, and each rod is is also going to have a mass. So, so let's say, you know, this rod, for example, let's say its mass is little m. And uh, the kind of experiment we imagine is we, we build this collection of rods, and then we just do some experiments. Like, say, we measure the electric field at this point in the lattice, and we measure the electric field in that point of the lattice, and we see how correlated they are, something like that. Um, or the metric, you know, the Riemann tensor, if you like, to make it sound more gravitational. Um, so uh, to avoid the, so now we, now we have to, so that's our experiment. Okay, now we just have to satisfy our, our two constraints. So let's first do no black hole. 
the no black hole constraint. Okay. So for that to work, um, what we need is that we need the linear size of this collection of rods to be large compared to its Schwarzschild radius. Because if it were not large compared to its Schwarzschild radius, then it would be a black hole and nothing could escape. Okay. So, um, well, to test that, we have to write its Schwarzschild radius, which is uh, 2gm uh, over c squared. So that's uh, the Schwarzschild radius, right? But then I want to write that in terms of the rods. So it's 2g times little m, which is the mass per rod. Uh, divided by c squared, and then I have to multiply by the number of rods, which, uh, you know, at the level of rigor that we're using here, we can just call L over little l cubed. Okay. Not quite right, but good enough. We're certainly not worrying about order one factors here anyways. Okay. Um, so we can, we can rewrite this um, in the following way. So we can say that little m over m plank um, has to be much less than um, little l over big L quantity squared times um, little l over l plank. Okay. And so the, the, writing it this way, everything is dimensionless. So then we don't get hung up on where the h bars and c's and, and so on went. Okay. Now, um, in order to have a useful set of rods, um, we need big L to be large compared to little L, because if that's not true, then there just aren't many rods, right? I mean, that is not much of a lattice. We're not really doing anything. Okay. So, so this is small. Okay. On the other hand, you know, in daily circumstances, um, such as in my office or wherever you are sitting, um, this uh, is big typically, right? Because L Planck is very small. As we discussed earlier, L Planck is like 10 to minus 35 meters or something. Um, so, you know, if, if this were like the LIGO detector or something, right? Like this L would be like, you know, kilometers. And uh, well, kilometers are very, very big compared to 10 to minus 35 meters. So, um, so although this is small, this would be very big and therefore, and therefore it's, a, it's okay for, for this to be small. Okay, the, the pieces of the LIGO detector uh, can, can be small enough that they're not gonna run into trouble with this uh, inequality. On the other hand, if we want to probe um, locality um, at the Planck scale, you know, which is what we should do if we want to, if we really want to test the quantum gravity as a local path integral, um, then we should take L of order L Planck, okay? Um, since that's the scale at which we're trying to, to verify locality. But then if you look at this inequality, it tells us that we're just going to need, um, well, at least, and actually a lot more, we're going to need that M is very small compared to M Planck. Okay, so our rods will have to be quite light. All right. They'll actually have to be a lot lighter than this because I just ignored this factor. Okay, but th but this will be good enough to get a contradiction, so I'll just do that. Okay, so that's that's problem number one. Okay, now we also want to suppress um, quantum fluctuations. Okay, um, so uh, in order for that to work. We need um, L, the length of the rods, um, to be large compared to the typical uncertainty in the locations of the rods. Right. Um, so, uh, well, by the uncertainty principle, that is just going to be um, H bar over uh, the uncertainty in momentum. And since we want the rods to be non relativistic, if the rods were flying around close to the speed of light, this would be a rather strange experiment. We didn't really have the interpretation I just said. So then I can get, I can get by with the non-relativistic expression of momentum. So I can call this uh, M delta V. Um, and since, again, I want things to be non-relativistic, I want this to be small compared to C. Um, so, uh, so I want this to be, much bigger than h bar 
over MC, okay? And so if you uh, reshuffle this around a bit again, then what you get is that M over M Planck um, has to be very large compared to L Planck over L. So, uh, so again, in, in daily situations, right, L is much bigger than L Planck. So the right-hand side is very small. And so there's not really a problem with being on the right side of this inequality, um, you know, which is good, right? Like, uh, you know, I'm sitting here talking to you all, my, my desk and my computer are not fluctuating all over the place, right? I have a fair, fairly good idea where I am. But again, for, for quantum gravity, right, then we want to be in, to probe the locality of quantum gravity of the Planck scale, we want to take L to be of order L Planck, right, which means we want this to be order one, okay? But then you see immediately, right, then we're going to need to have M much greater than M Planck, um, okay? And, and these two inequalities are just not compatible with each other, too bad. Okay. So somehow you just can't satisfy all the constraints that you need to probe locality at the Planck scale, you know, along the lines of the sort of relational observables that, that Einstein introduced. Um, so uh, here's where I now insert a sort of philosophical bias, right? Which is that I say, well, if, if in practice you can not actually test this anyway, then maybe we shouldn't be so attached to it as a central hypothesis. Maybe what's, what's going on is, is somehow stranger you know, it doesn't, it doesn't need to use, or it doesn't include this assumption in which anyways we can't actually test. Um, okay, so a question from Eric. Uh, so um, it, I, mean, I, I think that this, this, this argument is, re is very illuminating, but it is an, in, in a way it's quite limited because it's a, you're, you're talking about a very particular kind of experiment, one using rods. Yeah. And you, know, exper exper you, you never make money betting against the ingenuity of experimentalists. You know, the, the, the LIGO people are making measure, you know, are, are measuring effective distances that are, you know, orders of magnitude smaller than the proton radius, but they don't actually, they're not using rods that are that size. They found ways around it. They found ways to kind of indirectly probe spatial scales that small. Yes. So, so it, yeah. it, I mean, so, so the fact that you can't like by brute force probe, probe these scales, like in, in the most kind of you know, obvious way possible using a rod, doesn't mean that there aren't ways experimentalists won't come up with to in fact do it. That, yeah. So don't offer this kind of argument. Right. I mean, that's why I said this is not a rigorous argument. It's a plausibility or heuristic argument, right? I mean, on the other hand, I suspect. I mean, the the ingredients here are so simple that. It seems to me that just uh, sort of trying to, you know, use lasers instead of rods and so on is not going to get you out of the, the core, you know, the key contradiction. Um, you know, and maybe I'll also add that, I mean, there is historical precedent for arguments like this being correct, right? Like Heisenberg had an argument that you can't measure both the position and the momentum, right? And, you know, you could have said the same thing. You could have said, okay, well, you can't measure it the way that Heisenberg thought about measuring it, but maybe there's some other way you can measure it. I mean, after all, come on, it's a particle. It's clearly got a position and momentum, right? I mean, you know, so, so this is, I, I view this argument as kind of along those lines where, you know, it's not, it's not decisive because until you have a theory that takes advantage of it, you don't know whether it's really, you know, right or not, right? Um, I mean, somehow it seems though that in these holographic theories like ADS-CFT, we do have a theory that in some sense takes advantage of this, um, which I'll try to explain uh, in later lectures. And so that increases my prior, um, sorry, I know you're not a Bayesian, uh, that, um, that this kind of is getting at the right idea. Um, but yeah, I, by itself, I would not view this as, as decisive. This is just kind of suggestive, I would say. Yeah. Um, other questions? Okay, so I, I want to mention two other things that are kind of going in the same direction of this argument, but in a different, in a, you know, maybe more conventional way. Um, so uh, 
so so just another way of another way of thinking about this um, uh, is starting with uh, Bekenstein and Hawking's famous formula for the entropy of a black hole. Um, so so Bekenstein and Hawking told us that the entropy of a black hole, which is also the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So this is one of those great acronyms um, that works either way. Um, is given by uh, well, okay, I'm I'm haphazardly occasionally writing these units just in case people like them. Um, it's given by the area of the horizon of a black hole times c cubed um, divided by four g times h bar. Okay. So so area is the the area of the horizon of the black hole. So so this area um, is is four pi times the Schwarzschild radius squared. So we're going to um, we're going to discuss the origin of this formula in the next lecture. So so for this lecture, we're just going to take it as uh, you know passed down to us on stone tablets. Um, I mean, maybe you guys would rather you know passed down from the Academy of Athens or something. I don't know, but anyways. Um, so uh, in this lecture, we're just going to going to think about the consequences of this formula. In the next next lecture, we'll talk a bit about why we think this formula is true, although I guess uh, Sebastian talked some about that about some of that last time. Uh, well, yeah, earlier today. So uh, perhaps the most mysterious feature of this um, formula is that it's subextensive. Subextensive, yes. So in ordinary thermal systems, like a, a gas of particles, the entropy of a system at finite temperature is proportional to the volume of the system in units of the temperature. Uh, you know, if you have a gas of photons or gas of massive non-relativistic particles, um, the entropy is always extensive. And that's sort of important for engines and things like that, um, ovens. And the physics of that is really quite simple. It actually comes from this locality of the path integral that we were talking about. You just have independent degrees of freedom at each point in space. That's what this local action that we were writing down says. Um, and, and at finite temperature, they're all kind of fluctuating independently. So you have, you know, over here, there's something fluctuating over here and over there, right? And each of those fluctuating degrees of freedom add some contribution to the entropy. And so if you have a, a big chunk of them all in thermal equilibrium, then you should just add them all up and that gives you an extensive entropy. Um, but that's not what this is, right? This is not, at least in any naive sense, the volume of the black hole. It's a little bit hard to try to define the notion of volume of a black hole, but we can just pretend that it would be something like the Schwarzschild radius cubed. Uh, but that's not what this is, right? This is the Schwarzschild radius squared. Um, and so what this somehow suggests is that what the picture of the black hole should be is that, you know, you kind of tile it, you tile its, its horizon with little cells, right? Um, you know, each of which has, is kind of L Planck in size, right? And if you imagine that a black hole consists of a bunch of, you know, weakly interacting or maybe even strongly interacting local degrees of freedom on the surface of the horizon, then you would come up with an entropy formula like this. Okay. But this picture of a bunch of degrees of freedom, you know, localized on the horizon interacting with each other is really not what you get from this local path integral in the bulk, right? There you, well, I don't use the word bulk yet, but for just from this local path integral, you just have a bunch of, uh, you know, there you have a, you know, there you would also have independent degrees of freedom inside the black hole, right? And, and why aren't those also contributing to the entropy. Um, so somehow this formula is suggesting um, that, I'll put a question mark, it's suggesting that there exist fewer um, degrees of freedom um, than, uh, than uh, the, the local path integral. Um, 
would suggest. Um, and so somehow this argument that I just gave was kind of an argument that in this con you know, viewed in this light is kind of saying that maybe it's okay that there are fewer degrees of freedom. You know, you might have thought there were more, but then if you actually tried to measure them, you would run into this kind of problem. And so maybe that 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 makes it somehow okay that uh, you really just have this area's worth of degrees of freedom and not volumes worth. You know, even if you try to measure the volume ones, you just collapse into a black hole instead of instead of measuring them. Any questions about that? That's the next point. There'll be one final point. Uh, yes, uh, Siddharth. Or Eric, is that a new question? That's an old question, right, Eric? So I think it's Siddharth. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so just the second argument that you provided. Yeah. Uh, the local path integral that you wrote down, does that really suggest uh, the that the entropy will scale as the volume? Because as you pointed out, it has a scale at which it breaks down, right? I mean, that came with- Yeah, yes. Well, right, right. But I mean, that, so still that, that, but that just means as long as the temperature is less than the scale where it breaks. So, right. So if, if the temperature is higher than the scale that, where it breaks down, then you would probably guess that the entropy should be like the volume in the units of the scale where it breaks down. If the temperature is lower than the scale where it breaks down, then you would guess it's the volume in units of the temperature. So like, yeah, if, like if you just did a quantum field theory on a lattice, right, that has a scale where it breaks down and then it works like what I just said. If the temperature is high compared to the lattice scale, then it's really just infinite temperature. And so you're just counting all the states in the in the lattice, which is just the volume in lattice units. So either way, you get the volume. So this is saying somehow that, yeah, I mean, there is some scale where it breaks down, but it has to work differently than a lattice. You know, a lattice is too local to explain this. Uh, and may I also ask a question about the previous argument? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just a little bit confused about, um, you, you said that, you know, we're trying to probe locality at the Planck scale. Can you just explain why that would be the scale at which we are testing? Well, right. So um, that was the that was this discussion that we had earlier, right? So uh, so about the non-renormalizability, right? So there's this mass scale where we know that gravity is going to be strongly coupled. So so the whole question about quantum gravity is what happens there. Below below that scale, we can kind of just do perturbation theory, and if we choose to just be, uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, um, epistemologically humble, to just not worry about what happens at that scale, then we don't have to think too much about quantum gravity. Uh, you know, there are some, I mean, there are situations in the world where, you know, like in the center of black holes or in the early universe where that scale is important. So I don't think that's a very responsible position for someone who wants to understand the fundamental laws of nature. Um, but anyways, yeah, so we, there's this scale that the theory gives us. And so if we can somehow preserve locality at that scale, you know, as the asymptotic safety people hope to do, um, you know, then maybe we can preserve it all the way up. Yeah. But certainly, we, certainly we, that, that's the first scale where we don't know, really. Yeah. I'd say now a bunch of questions. Okay, I think Eric again, and then uh, Vincenzo. So the, the, argument, the argument you gave that, um, that the Planck scale is relevant in the sense that, um, that you just mentioned for non-normalizability, yeah. that was based... That, 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 that's based on a linearization over the path integral, but you're poo-pooing the path integral. So should should we real should we trust this non-renormalizability argument that gives us the Planck scale? Well, so Eric, if I, I mean, as you know, when I when I find a, a when I demonstrate a contradiction, right? I mean, I, I'm trying to demonstrate a contradiction. I'm not yet trying to tell you how how I think things actually work. I guess I'm hinting at it a bit here, right? Um, but I, I think I'm allowed to, in driving a contradiction, I'm allowed to follow the rules of the, you know, of my hypothetical, of, of my assumptions, right? So. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't. I didn't. I, I'm sorry. I didn't follow the argumentative logic. So you're saying that at least for at least still in the standard story, we should work. We should be worrying about the Planck scale. That's right. Yeah, I'm trying to drive a contradiction within the standard story. 
Yeah. Okay. I, I'm so I, I'm sorry. I I I had missed the argument of content. Sure. Um. All right, Vincenzo. Um, I I have to say something about your not rigorous argument uh, on the possibility to to test uh, quantum gravity. Uh, mm -hmm. The contradiction about the mass. Um, it seems to me that perhaps this argument, it, it is more an argument about the fact that uh, uh, our present theories uh, about what happened at the uh, Planck scales are in a contradiction. Uh, because we, you, you assume a, a lot of things about quantum, about the um, quantum mechanics and, uh, and the relativity in a certain sense, about standard physics. And your attitude is a sort of a contradiction about what happened at Planck scale. Uh, because if you think about uh, uh, t the testing of a hypothesis, uh, take for instance uh, the case of uh, the, the Thomistic hypothesis at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. In, the, in the book by, uh, by uh, Lisa Tom, the book by, uh, I don't remember the name of this French scientist now because I'm uh, <laughs> too old. <laughs> okay. Uh, and this, you, you find this book uh, a lot of uh, proof of the, 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 atom, the atomic hypothesis based on what happened at macroscopic level. Yeah. Also, so, so it is not necessary to have an instrument that go exactly at the scale where things happen, to have an evidence covering a certain... Well, I, no, I, agree, certain... I, I, I agree with this 100%, yes. Okay. Is... Yes, no, I agree. And I mean, again, I'm not... Uh... So I, I, I view this argument so that in the tradition of you know taking the laws of physics as we currently understanding them and extrapolating them to an extreme regime and seeing if they get into trouble, you know, similar to uh, you know in the in, in the beginning of the 20th century, right? If you if you take thermodynamics and you apply it to the electromagnetic field and you assume that you can just trust the electromagnetic field down to arbitrarily short distances, Maxwell theory then you get a contradiction where the energy of an oven is infinite. Right? And so, so I view that as telling you that something has to change. But just by coming up with these contradictions, you can't necessarily, right, or like Einstein thinking about trains that are moving near the speed of light, right? I mean, there are many examples like this where you just kind of push the theory into, a, into an extreme regime and see if it gets into trouble. Um, and if it does, then there's a suggestion that's, then I, I would interpret that as saying there has to be some new physics that resolves it. Um, but you can't figure out what new physics is usually just by making these arguments, right? This is kind of more just to kind of help guide you, you know, but in, in, yeah, in the end, you, you need to have a theory, right? It's not enough to just sort of be a complainer. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the, guy was, the guy was a parent. Per <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Okay, um, so let me just discuss briefly the last thing. So we'll talk about it more probably next time. So, so the most, so sort of the sharpest contradiction that's come out of thinking about these kinds of things, um, of course, is 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 Hawking's information problem, which I guess Eric talked about this morning. I apologize that the time zones make it impossible for me to attend the lectures in the morning session. Um, so I'm not sure what he said, um, but I will say a little now and then I'll say more later. Um, so if we, uh, if we take this formula, which right now we're just taking as an assumption for the entropy, uh, then we can use the famous fact that DE equals TDS to tell us that T um, is equal to H bar times uh, C, uh, C cubed divided by eight pi GM, okay, which is the, the Hawking temperature. Um, and if we think a little bit harder, which we'll discuss next time, then we can convince ourselves that black holes should actually radiate um, at this temperature. Um, Now, in fact, Hawking 
showed something even more than that. He showed that at least if the black hole is big, meaning that its Schwarzschild radius is large compared to the Planck scale, then you should expect that the radiation that comes out of the black hole is in a state which microscopically is very close to thermal. Uh, you know, not just approximately thermal, you know, the way that when you drop, you know, sugar into your coffee and wait for a little bit, it's approximately thermal, but a really exactly, you know, the state is rho equals e to the minus beta h divided by z. And um, this is really quite different from what happens, for example, if you if you burn a piece of paper, right? If you if you burn a piece of paper, then well, at least in principle, if you if you collected all of the heat and ash and smoke and everything that came out of that, and you were really really good at experimental physics, then you could figure out what was written on the piece of paper, um, you know, just starting from the heat and the ash and the smoke. Um, now, of course, in practice, that's impossible, but you all are philosophers, so you don't care about that. Uh, in principle, you could do it with burning a piece of paper. Um, but Hawking's calculation says that you cannot do that with a black hole. So you, you, know, you make a black hole and you, know, you throw a diary into it or something. Uh, you, know, you throw, uh, I don't know, you throw the Nicomachean ethics into it. Uh, let's say you, you pick, you either throw in the Nicomachean ethics or you throw in Plato's Republic. And then the question is, uh, after, then you wait for the black hole to evaporate. And now from the radiation, you want to figure out, did we throw in the Nicomachean ethics or did we throw in Plato's Republic? And Hawking would say that the answer is that you can't know just by looking at the Hawking radiation, that information is gone. Um, uh, that's what his calculation would, would, would suggest. Um, and if that were really true, it would be a disaster for quantum mechanics, right? So because in, in quantum mechanics, time evolution is like this, right? We've already written it several times. And well, if you have access to this state, then you can just uh, feed it into a quantum computer and act on it with e to the plus i h t and get psi, right? And then you can just see, um, which book you threw into the black hole. Okay, so if Hawking's calculation is right, uh, then this is wrong. Uh, and that's really bad, or I don't know, good or bad. We're not trying to be normative here, but at least that's a, a major change in the laws of physics as we currently understand them. So um, the most common view is that um, Hawking's argument is actually wrong. Uh, and that um, e to the minus i h t times psi is actually right. Okay, that's these days the most common view, although it wasn't always. And certainly there are still people who, who believe that Hawking was right uh, and that information is lost. Um, but, um, well, okay, it's fine to say you don't believe Hawking, but Hawking was a smart guy. So if you don't, if you don't believe Hawking, then you have to say which step of his calculation is wrong. Okay, I think we can agree that there's a burden of proof on you to, uh, to, uh, to explain that if you wanna say that Hawking is wrong. Okay. Um, and people have spent the last four decades um, trying to answer that question. Um, I would say so far they still have not succeeded, at least not completely. Um, there's some sense in which, there, I mean, there's some sense in which we've succeeded in that we can just say his assumptions are not correct. You know, at least if we believe in something like holography, then I. Uh, well, that the equations for holography look quite different from the equations that Hawking was was using. So we can certainly say that, and that's what most people will say. But that still doesn't tell you. Then, then the question is, okay, so what's the calculation you should have done instead? Tell us that, you know. And, and we haven't and we haven't managed to answer that question yet. Um, and in fact, our our understanding is so primitive that, you know, going on nine years ago, some fairly well-regarded people who we call imps um, argued that in fact, the only way for black hole physics to be consistent with unitarity um, is for the horizon of almost any black hole to be shrouded in what they call a firewall, which is a, a singular concentration of energy that immediately destroys anyone who, who, who tries to pass through it. Um, now, I wouldn't say that 
too many people actually believe that or are convinced that that's what actually happened. But the realization that even this crazy proposal could not be refuted kind of shocked the community into action. You know, I mean, come on, we can't even, we can't even really, we can't even answer that question, you know, in any educated way, <laughs> you know, and in the last, uh, you know, in the ensuing years, uh, we still haven't solved the information problem, but we've learned a lot about the question of how uh, in holographic theories, um, this local description of space-time can emerge in some approximate situation, you know, in some restricted regime of validity, how the tools of that emergence can be used to study black hole evaporation. And in particular, there's this thing called the page curve, which is the von Neumann entropy of the radiation as a function of time. And so using these various ideas about the emergence of space-time, we've seen that uh, they all sort of point in the direction indeed of e to the minus i h t being the right equation. Uh, and at least some aspects of Hawking's calculation, we now know how to do in a, in a holographic setting and see why the answer is different. On the other hand, we still haven't refuted this crazy firewall thing, right? So, I mean, we don't, you know, or, or, or explained, you know, what really is the mechanism from the gravitational point of view for how the information gets out. Um, but we've learned a lot. Uh, and so uh, in the rest of these lectures, so uh, this was kind of the introductory lecture. Next time, I'll go a bit more into the semi-classical physics of black holes and try to give some sketch of why we think S equals A over 4G and how that leads to the information problem. Right, and then in the last two lectures, I'll talk about EDS CFT and the emergence of space time uh, in the, you know, in the context of some toy models so that give you some sense of what's been going on uh, in recent times uh, towards this problem. And hopefully you'll be convinced that we've learned something, uh, even though we haven't learned everything. Um, so that's it for all I had to say today. I guess we still have 20 minutes. I'm, I'm happy to do more Q&A. Thank you very much, Daniel. We have plenty of time for uh, for questions. Uh, I see Su Sakshi. Sakshi, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, one question that's really kind of been gnawing at me for a long time, and I think you're the perfect person to answer this question, uh, given the Harlow-Hayden conjecture, is what is the role of the measurement problem when we're talking about these operationalist experiments? I mean, we talk about, you know, unitarity being key. And, you know, if we don't even think about, you know, spontaneous collapse theories, but just experiments, and we want to operate on the Hawking radiation and see if we can recover the initial state, and, you know, we bring in quantum computing and all that, you know, to what extent are we kind of shoving something under the rug that, you know, these operations will... Mayor, so that's what I want to kind of clarify. Like, can you actually do any of these operationalist experiments without invoking some sort of information loss through measurement collapse? Uh, yeah. Okay. So let me make a few comments. Um, so if you if you restrict to experiments that are done by someone outside of the black hole, someone who never jumps into the black hole, then I. think think, although I don't know for sure, of course, because I don't have a complete theory of quantum gravity that's realistic, but at least in the quantum gravity theories that we do have, um, the measurement theory is the same as in ordinary quantum mechanics. Because, um, well, since you, maybe, maybe I'll make a, a comment about what I mean by that. So to me, the measurement theory of quantum mechanics based on an approximation where the number of degrees of freedom in the, in the measuring apparatus is large. Um, and uh, when you have a black hole that you're not jumping into, then uh, you can, for example, be in flat space and you can build arbitrarily complicated devices outside of the black hole and do arbitrarily complicated measurements if you take enough time doing them. And so that's the kind of regime where I expect the standard formalism of quantum mechanics to be correct. Um, on the other hand, when you think about observers who jump into black holes, they're now fundamentally, fundamentally limited in what they can do. You know, there's some finite amount of mass that they can carry with them. There's some finite amount of time before they can hit the singularity. 
And my own personal suspicion is that the experiences of such observers are not described using the standard formulation of quantum mechanics. Just because the, the an argument somewhat similar to the one I gave before, the standard formulation would give them probabilities that are real numbers, which I think would not really be meaningful for them because they can't repeat the experiment, they can't call in Wigner's friend and so on, right? Um, but I don't really know, I mean, to me, so it's it's kind of backing off of this limit where the observer is has infinitely many degrees of freedom and arbitrary amount of time to, to measure things. Um, so, yeah, I suspect that the measurement theory of someone who falls in will will be different. There will probably be just some inherent imprecision in it, you know, due to the limited constraints. But yeah, I don't have too much quantitative to say about it, right? I mean, I don't really know what an approximate version of probability would look like. Um, you know, a, a theory of probability. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, we've got our frequentist friends over there, right? But uh, yeah, so how do, how do frequentists think about a world where you can only ever do a finite number, you know, there's a bound on how many experiments you can do. Um, you know, probably there will, right, I mean, there, yeah, there will, I, well, I don't know, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if I answered your question or not, but. I think you somewhat answered it. So basically, if we're doing operationalist experiments, you know, for free falling observers, let's say, or just kind of sufficiently, within the regime where we might expect this contradiction to arise and we're just like not even worrying about it because the theory would be very different. But for someone, uh, an observer very far away at like, you know, asymptotically flat infinity standard quantum mechanics applies. But in that case, you would still concede then, I mean, of course, unless you're an Everettian, but like even for an Everettian along a single kind of trajectory of branches, there would be information loss. So we would still concede that for the global state, you know, we can't really say anything about um, unitarity for the global state. You would, like you would still have to have the black hole and the radiation be a subsystem of the global state. Yeah, but that's, I mean, so that's why I said you have the apparatus outside, right? So, I mean, I mean, yeah, to be clear, I mean, the information loss of Hawking is is different from, you know, the wave function collapse in, a, in the measurement, right? I mean, no, 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 exactly. So to me, like the problem is with information loss is that we um, have the global state being just to use kind of certain terms mixed at the end yeah. versus pure initially yeah, that's right. and to me it seems like the operationalist experiments of an observer outside the black hole don't necessarily solve that problem well they certainly don't solve it because you i mean it's a real problem right i mean right. You, you, i mean whenever we talk about quantum mechanics right I mean, when I say that the evolution of the state is e to the minus i h t psi, right? You know, if I'm a Copenhagen or whatever, then I have to say that that's what the evolution is when we're not looking at it or something, right? Right. right. And but that's the same evolution I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the evolution when we're not looking at it. So, you, you, you know, we can we can think about you know decoherence and so on and try to bring the measurement into it but already just at the level of what it's doing when we're not looking at it hawking says that it's decohering um you know that pure the pure state is evolving to a mixed state and so i that that can't be fixed by thinking about the measurements that you do afterwards i think is what i'm saying okay so that's i i guess that's what i wanted clarity on because maybe yeah. just the literature it made it seem like if you do certain operations on the hawking radiation um, and you can figure out what constituted the black hole that somehow you bypass this kind of fundamental change in how the state evolves. Well, yeah, because you do, because you do the, the operations, if you're smart, you don't just do, you know, projective measurements on the, Haw you know, on the Hawking radiation in some simple basis, right? Because that'll just destroy everything. So if you're right. smart, that's not what you do, right? If you're smart, you, you feed the Hawking radiation into a quantum computer and you do some you know, quantum algorithm, for example, there are quantum algorithms, you know, if I give you 10 copies of the black hole, there's a quantum algorithm that tells you whether the state is pure to a very high probability, um, oh. you know, without, yeah, but you definitely don't just like do a complete measurement and then try to infer the wave function because then you would need exponentially many copies. Right. right. I mean, okay. which you could eventually do, right? I mean, you could have exponentially many copies, right? But yeah, in practice, that's probably not what you want to do. Right. Um, 
Thank but you, you know, I should say, I mean, maybe I should say though, I mean, the reason, you know, one of the brilliant things of this AMPS paradox was that, you know, although I don't believe the conclusion, um, you know, they showed that there was a, that there was a problem for a very simple and obvious experiment for the infalling observer. It's not like, oh, I do some, you know, very complicated measurement or something. I just jump in and my experiment is die or not die. Okay. And what, however, I think quantum mechanics might be modified or whatever, small corrections, blah, blah, blah. And the interior, right? Like, I mean, that question better have an answer, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, and the fact that we can get into trouble even with that question, you know, suggests that there's some very basic thing that we need to understand better. Um, uh, there is another question by C. Dart. Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah. My question is about, so you mentioned a few uh, different issues or concerns or uh, observations that tell you why quantizing gravity in terms of a local problem to go uh, is perhaps difficult or has barriers. And I, I, I feel like one of them, just the problem or issue of diffeomorphism invariance is not like the others, right? Like somehow all the others seem to have something to do with uh, things breaking down at Planck scale uh, yeah. in different ways. Whereas the diffeomorphism invariance seems somewhat different. Can you just perhaps comment on that? Or maybe right. in the uh, thought experiment that you sketched at the end, perhaps say if the diffeomorphism invariance problem shows up there as well? Right. So, okay. So I'll make two comments about that. So the first is that I sort of agree. I tend to view diffeomorphism invariance as mostly a technical obstacle that you just have to learn to think about in the right way, and then it's fine. But on the other hand, it, it is important in this argument because um, when I talked about why there are black holes, I said that an important part of it was that gravity is universal. Um, and that's essentially a consequence of diffeomorphism invariance. So, so, right, because that it's universal because to make the action covariant, you have to put that square root of minus G there and you have to promote the derivatives to covariant derivatives and so on. Um, so in theories that are not diff invariant, you just, you wouldn't expect to have a universal force and you wouldn't expect to have black holes. So, so in that sense, you know, diffeomorphism invariance is, is part of the story. And I think it's also part of the story in the sense that it's because of diff invariance that I needed to introduce the rods in the first place. Because if, if there were just some preferred coordinates that we could use, you know, that were somehow physically meaningful, I wouldn't have to go to the bother of setting up the coordinates using rods, right? I could just somehow measure in those coordinates. And then, uh, and then I wouldn't have this, this problem that I described. So, so I, I think it's part of the story. You know, it, 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 is an, it is an important part of gravity. I don't wanna say it's a complete distraction. You know, on the other hand, there are theories that have it, but don't have these problems. Uh, it's just those theories also kind of don't have black holes, which is, I mean, that's kind of the out, right? It's the, the I mentioned those theories that have different variants and low dimension, but, but those theories don't have black holes in the sense that you can, you know, have a bunch of matter and then it collapses, right? Like that, that doesn't happen in those theories um, because they're just kind of, they're just kind of too boring to, to have that happen. Um, yeah, so somehow, you know, in order to have this contradiction, you kind of need all the ingredients. And uh, yeah, I, maybe I would say these are these two are kind of part of thing. There are two things on the list of ingredients, but but they're not all the ingredients. And just, just can you just clarify why universality is a consequence of different variants? Um, well, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, the math way is understanding is what I said, right? It's just to write a different variant action, the metric needs to interact with all the other fields. Yeah. I, I mean, I can try to say a more heuristic thing about particles moving on geodesics or something, but. Are there questions from people who haven't asked questions yet? I like new uh, audience members. Yes. May, may I ask something, Daniel? Uh, yeah. Uh, Kirill, Kirill, okay, Kirill, go ahead, Kirill. It's just, just a short one. So I wanted uh, just to be very clear on um, what implications the, the Bekenstein uh, entropy formula has on, on the argument you, you've made earlier. So, early, so um, as, as you pointed out, the, the outcome is that the entropy scales with the surface area rather than the volume. 
and, and the number of degrees of freedom, as, as you say, um, scales with, uh, so that's as, as the way I understand that you uh, are pointing what at is that the number of degrees of freedom scales with the surface area rather than volume. And yeah. this is in tension with what you have in this uh, no black hole uh, first line where you, um, L over L scales with, with, the, with, the, with the cube, right? So yeah. where you volume, right? So, but to be like super clear, how do you get from the entropy to this, um, I mean, to this cube of L over L? I mean, oh, well, sorry. So one I, yeah, so I didn't use the entropy formula in this argument, right? I just, I, I just tried to explicitly construct everything. You know, I, I, this wasn't necessarily a counting paradox per se. Mm -hmm. I, you know, in the end, I was just trying to measure some correlators of local fields, you know, at, at the Planck scale, you know, which, which were localized to the Planck scale. Um, so the way I view the logic is that um, the Bekenstein-Hawking formula is telling you that um, there aren't, that there are fewer degrees of freedom than you expect. And then this argument is kind of playing, you know, it's kind of playing the role of the uncertainty principle where um, it kind of tells you why that's okay, right? I mean, another way of saying this is that, yeah, yeah I mean, I was going to emphasize this more in later lectures, but I mean, the reason why we like local actions, as I already mentioned, is that they preserve causality. You know, the best way to make sure that we can't instantaneously communicate at a distance is to just make sure that there aren't any interactions between what's going on here and what's going on there. You know, the only way to communicate is to interact with your neighbors and then send a signal down the chain, okay? That's how local quantum field theory works. Um, if you imagine that the theory is non-local so that there are somehow direct interactions between distant points, then you immediately have to worry that you're going to run into all kinds of disasters, you know, with, uh, you know, going back and killing your grandfather and whatever, right? I mean, all the usual problems you have when you violate causality. Um, and so somehow what this argument is kind of saying is that, um, or suggesting is that maybe some level of non-locality is okay, because if you, if you really try to test it, you'll, you'll somehow just everything will collapse into a black hole. And so instead of validity or something, everybody will just get killed in the singularity. Um, you know, this is, I mean, as I said, this is a bit heuristic, you know, it, we'll see later that, you know, when, when we actually have a theory like ADS-CFT, we can ask much more precise questions, right? Like where we can uh, try to see, we can really try to push this, you know, and say, okay, you know, you've got some, you know, this theory is, uh, it's pretending to be three plus one dimensional, but it's really two plus one dimensional. So it's got to be non-local. So let's try to probe that non-locality and, you know, see that the theory is, you know, really two plus one dimensional and use that to get us into trouble. And what we'll always find is that, you know, right when we're going to get into trouble, then we, we end up creating a black hole instead. Uh, and, and in these theories, you can kind of see the mechanism working more concretely here. Here, it was kind of more heuristic. Okay, okay. So uh, to summarize, um, so the, the um, aspect about put is that something is different with respect to what one would observe, one would expect to um, using assume when assuming locality. And so assuming that this is the right account, then no locality is, is, is fine, but the details come, come later, as you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we need a theory, right? I mean, this is this is just kind of, uh, uh, you know, posturing at the moment, right? I mean, it's trying sort of post facto trying to motivate the kind of theories that we're going to study. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Comment by Eric. Okay, I pose my question. Can you say, Daniel, something more about uh, the second problem of quantum gravity, that is uh, the general covariance the pheomorphism? Is it the fact that uh, in general relativity is not possible to promote uh, um, uh, uh, symmetry from global to local, and this is a problem to put together a general and quantum mechanics or, or 
I, I was not able to understand exactly. Yeah, it's, it's really just that you can't, that, that local observables are not measurable. So, so what, what the different variance does is it, for, it forces you to use non-local observables that are relational. So, I mean, more prosaically, it forces you to do things like create this lattice of rods. You know, if you want to, I mean, when you, whenever you do an experiment, you really have to say where everything got put in a physical way. You know, how did I, you know, I started here and then I moved this way according to this laser and then I put this thing there. And so every experiment comes along with this baggage of the apparatus that you had to use to get everything set up. Uh, and then what I was trying to express here is that this baggage, sometimes you pay a price for it. Um, you know, it kind of limits the, the kind of things that you can hope to do. Um, and that's and that's different from in quantum field theory where you you know you, you yeah you just you measure the field here you measure the field there you know exactly how to do it you know there's no uh, there's no worries about the superstructure behind it. Mm -hmm.